By the end of this video, you are going to know the Amber case study back to front, inside out. Let's get into it. So I'm going to read through each paragraph in case study 2, and then we're going to analyse each one. Bear in mind that at the end of this video, I'm going to leave a link to another video that I've created with 40 questions to test your comprehension of this case study. So as I said, I'll leave the link for that later on in the video. So let's have a look. Case study 2. Amber is 21 and works as a trainee actuary after completing her degree apprenticeship. Amber lives at home with her nan and pays rent every month. So Amber is 21, she's at an early stage in the life cycle. She works as a trainee actuary, which is a role in insurance companies assessing the level of risk. So we'd assume that she's fairly financially astute, that she's pretty good with money. And after completing her degree apprenticeship, so she's got a, a high level of education, she now lives at home with her nan and pays rent every month. So the fact that she lives at home is likely to mean that she's got less bills than potentially someone living elsewhere by themselves in rented accommodation, for example. And also she pays rent every month. Now, we uh, could see this as a, a mandatory form of expenditure, but of course the fact that she lives with her nan, potentially we might uh, see that as uh, less less strict than, as I said, if she has to pay rent to a landlord externally. Paragraph 2. Amber manages her finances well, ensuring that her mandatory expenses are paid. She often splits her remaining money into weekly amounts, withdrawing most of this as cash. Amber finds this very useful to help ensure that she does not overspend from month to month. Amber has no savings. So, as we said earlier, it appears that Amber manages her finances well and has obviously a good level of education in the area. She ensures her mandatory expenses are paid, so these are things that she cannot escape from, she has to pay. And she splits her remaining money into weekly amounts, and she withdraws most of it as cash. As we'll see later on in the case study, using cash has become less available in many retailers after the global COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, as such, she she might have have to have to change that later on. Now she finds it really useful at the moment to do cash, uh, to help ensure that she doesn't overspend from month to month, but there are other more digital, te technologically orientated uh, ways of ensuring she doesn't overspend, and later on in the case study we'll look at three current accounts and the features that each of those current accounts offer, which may assist Amber in her budgeting. She has no savings, so when we're choosing a current account for Amber, we can assume that she won't put a great value on any savings interest. The third paragraph. During the pandemic, Amber found that many shops stopped allowing her to use cash to make payments, with a switch to contactless payment. Amber adjusted to this well by keeping an accurate record of what she had spent. If she ever went over her weekly allowance, she would try to spend less the next week. But this was not always achievable, so Amber arranged a £400 overdraft, which she accesses when she overspends, and then tries to restrict her spending the following month. So as I said earlier, during the pandemic many shops chose not to accept cash, potentially because of the spread of Covid, and are now asking customers to pay with contactless payment to a greater extent. Now, Amber adjusted to that well, and she kept an accurate record of what she had spent. And as I said, later on in the case study, we'll look at some ways that she can do this digitally using new features of, of current accounts offered by a variety of providers. If she went over her weekly allowance, she would try and spend less than next week. So uh, a way of managing her cash flow. And this was not always achievable for Amber, so arranging a £400 overdraft is a way to, uh, to, to deal with that issue. Of course, a £400 overdraft, if Amber was to go into it and wasn't to pay it off shortly, she would have to pay interest on any money that she had within that overdraft. Later on in the case study, we'll see that one of the three current accounts offers a small... Uh, interest-free overdraft, her current account actually with Barclays. So um, 
that might factor might might be a factor in her decision which current account provider to choose. So, paragraph four. As shops have started to accept all payment methods, Amber has continued to use her contactless debit card. She does not record all her payments now, but does use her mobile banking to approximate her current position and how much money she has left. Amber is a little concerned that the contactless limit has gone up to £100. Amber is used to carrying cash, but she worries that someone could steal her card and spend by making contactless payments before she can cancel it. Previously, Amber felt her risk was limited to only the cash she had on her at the time. So, shops have started to accept all payment methods again, but Amber's actually chosen to continue to use her contactless debit card. Potentially, feel she feeling she feels that it's more convenient. Later on, we'll hear how the contactless limit has gone up now to one hundred pounds, from an original starting point when they were first introduced of just ten pounds. So, extremely convenient, and she, Amber can make uh, up to five contactless transactions per day without actually having to input her PIN. So, as I said, very convenient. She doesn't record all of her payments now like she used to, but she uses mobile banking to approximate her current position and how much money she has left. As I said, she can do all of this using her, her app from Barclays, but there are other providers on the market which may offer more facilities, so we'll look at those later. She's a little concerned the contactless limit, of course, has gone up to £100, because that might affect her budgeting, and as we'll see later on, um, a professional in the industry that suggests that accounting procedures, mental accounting procedures used by people might actually cause them to uh, to spend more than they had originally intended. She's used to carrying cash, but she worries that someone could steal her card and spend by making contactless payments before she can cancel it. That is a real worry because, of course, fraudulent use of cards could potentially increase if it's to do with contactless because a PIN doesn't have to be put in. So a, a criminal could easily utilise a card to, uh, to, to buy goods or services. However, later on in the case study, we'll hear that there are methods to, con uh, to cancel cards if that should happen. And you can even turn off the contactless feature altogether on a card. So that might be something that Amber may consider doing if she is concerned uh, that the contactless limit has gone up to £100. Although saying that, it seems like she has chosen to continue to use her contactless debit card because of the inherent um, convenience it offers. Previously, Amber felt her risk was limited to only the cash she had on her at the time, but of course, using a contactless, it does mean that up to £300 and five transactions can be made without her having to put in her PIN, or indeed a criminal having to put in her PIN. Fifth paragraph on page number 11. Amber also uses her mobile banking to check her balance and transfer money. She has banked with Barclays since she started a young person's saving account. Amber used to know most of the people who worked in her local branch, as she had been going there most of her life. However, recently, Amber has had less reason to visit her branch, as she makes mobile banking her preferred method of managing finances. Many people within Amber's stage of the life cycle, 21 and around the age, I think would uh, be able to empathise with this story. Many people in that age bracket will, of course, be using mobile banking significantly more than visiting their local branch. Now, as it said, Amber uses mobile banking to check her balance, to transfer money, and there's also a number of other things that she can now do through mobile banking and, and the banking apps. We'll come on to that later on. Now, the only reason it seems that she's stuck with Barclays thus far is obviously she started with them having a young person's savings account when she was a child, and she used to know most of the people who worked in her local branch. So that might have been a, a nice touch when she was visiting her branch uh, on a regular basis. However, of course, not having that much reason to visit her branch, it might encourage her to switch accounts, switch current accounts, if of course there is a better offer elsewhere. 
Of course, the switch, uh, the current account switch guarantee uh, may play a part in this case study or some of the questions that you're asked. The switch, uh, current account switch guarantee is something offered now, uh, in, uh, implemented originally by the government because it, it, the current account market wasn't very competitive. It, many people like Amber, they'd started a young person's account and stuck with that same provider for the rest of their lives. But of course, the government wants to facilitate competition within financial markets, so they implemented the current account switch guarantee. And what that means is uh, an individual like Amber can choose to switch their current account, and that switch will take place within seven days. All of the direct debits and standing orders will be switched across. Um, she will not have to notify any of her, the, the regular payments she makes. That will all be done for her. And payments to her old account will, uh, will be forwarded on to her new account without her having to take any further action. So a real incentive to switch to a new current account if there is a better offer available. Sixth paragraph on page number 11. Amber is aware that there are other banks with potentially better mobile banking facilities, but has stayed loyal to Barclays. She has decided to look at what other providers offer and compare it to what she has now. So a key point when we're looking at the three current accounts later on will be comparing it to what she has now. Of course, if she finds that Barclays offer the best facilities, then of course there's no, no real point in switching. But if there is, it may be worth using the switch guarantee. Let's move on to page number 12. So, page number 12 is the beginning of the research section. This is research which has been compiled for you to be able to answer the exam questions effectively. The first bit of research is from The Mirror, which of course is a tabloid newspaper. It begins, as a customer reaches the payment point of their transaction in a shop, will their increase to £100 affect their decisions? The next article, which is, as I said, from the Mirror, reviews this. It begins, will the increase in contactless make any difference? It replaces the old limit of £45, and we'll see later on, actually, that the original limit when contactless was first launched was actually just £10, so it's uh, increased tenfold. Any total higher than that, and users were required to use chip and PIN payments. As the contactless limit has increased, so has usage of contactless cards. So we can see there, as we said, the inherent convenience that contactless cards offer means that there's potentially no real surprise that usage has significantly increased. And we'll see the exact figures later on. The third paragraph, the number of consecutive payments before card users are required to provide their PIN will stay at five. However, the amount a person can spend across those five transactions has gone up to £300. So in theory, an individual could purchase five items, five services, for £60 each, and that would hit the transaction limit of £300. And only then would they have to put in their PIN. So what happens if someone steals my card? Some have criticised the increase and are worried about fraud and that bag snatchers may be more inclined to target people's wallets and purses, now that they can spend more on a contactless card before it is cancelled. A real legitimate concern, the fact that obviously fraudsters don't have to put in a chip and pin anymore, it is a real concern for many people that bag snatchers may be more inclined to target wallets and purses. But there is a way around it, as it says later on in the case study, a potential solution to this issue is the facilities offered with several current accounts, which enable you to cancel your card straight away as soon as it becomes, well, as soon as it is missing. So, next paragraph. But a spokesman for the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, told the BBC 
we have seen no material increase in fraudulent transactions in other countries where the contactless limit increased, in other countries with similar limits, to the equivalent of £100 or above. So that's a, a good sign, the fact that there's been no material increase in these fraudulent transactions where the contactless limit has increased. It might be that there's some sort of bias from the spokesperson as they are from the Financial Conduct Authority, but nonetheless a good sign, the fact that no increase in fraudulent transactions has been increased. And as we said, there are solutions as well as potentially cancelling your card straight away as soon as it got stolen, for example, by a bag snatcher, you can also, if you're worried about losing your card, request a non-contactless card from your banks. The final paragraph in that mirror source. So that is another option that Amber may choose to do if she's particularly concerned. However, as we said earlier, it seems that she has become accustomed to the inherent convenience of using a contactless card and therefore it would be unlikely that she'd want to requ request a non-contactless card. So moving on, the bottom of page number 12, some people are concerned at the implications of the £100 limit and this next article looks at what consumers can do. So how to set a contactless card spending cap to avoid the new £100 limit. Beginning on page number 13 it says the contactless card payment limit rose from £45 to £100 on the 15th of October. But Bank of Scotland, Danske Bank, Halifax, Lloyds and Starling will let you set your own limit, with Santander becoming the latest to also offer this service. Some providers will also let you turn off contactless completely. So... It really seems that, the source from Money Saving Expert, by the way, it really seems that many major providers are, uh, have anticipated that many of their consumers may be concerned about the risk of fraud in this contactless card. So therefore, they're offering many, many ways to reduce the potential for fraud. So you can set your own limit so from the 100 pounds you may choose to set a much lower limit if you're concerned it also allows you to turn off contactless completely so you may have a contactless card but through the app you can actually turn off the contactless facility so a real real great way for amber to support her budgeting really if she feels like um, and it says later on about the mental accounting if she feels that this will be a concern for her then there are options for her to reduce her her worry shall we say so the next article looks at the history of contactless payments and if the development of contactless payment is entirely positive so hopefully we'll see both sides of the argument here this source by the way is the Guardian, so it is a it is a, a broadsheet newspaper, and as I said, hopefully we'll be able to see both sides of the argument. It begins: contactless is making it easier to spend, but is that a good thing? The rise in the contactless payment ceiling to forty five pounds was aimed at reducing physical contact in shops during the pandemic, making it easier to shop without cash. The Treasury said moving it up to £100 would give a huge boost to the struggling retail sector, helping to support jobs and businesses. So, looking at that paragraph, the rise in the contactless payment ceiling to £45 aimed at reducing physical contact, well, it was vital during the pandemic, wasn't it? We did not want to have to hand coins and notes over so the increase in use in contactless payments during the pandemic was was uh, was expected and of course it made it easier to shop without using cash and that convenience is obviously appreciated by many people the treasury said moving it up to 100 pounds would give a huge boost to the struggling retail sector helping to support jobs and businesses so the treasury uh, part of the government who obviously deal with um, finances in our economy and taxation, for example, 
They uh, are eager to support the struggling retail sector, the retail sector uh, struggling on the back of the pandemic, of course. Many people made uh, redundant or out of work or uh, forced to go on furlough. And therefore, the Treasury really has an interest in boosting that retail sector because it gets people back into work, it supports businesses, it generates extra taxation revenue. But concerns have been raised that vulnerable customers may lose track of how much money they have spent or have in their account, and that the risk of fraud will grow for everyone. There are also fears that it will mean more retailers move away from accepting cash, locking out those customers who still rely on it. So, as it said on the first page of the case study, Amber previously drew out her money in cash each month to avoid overspending. Concerns have been raised that vulnerable customers may lose track of how much money they're spending or have in their account if they use contactless spending. As of course we talked about the risk of fraud already. It's a real concern once again. Vulnerable customers, people potentially on low incomes or um, those customers who are, don't have a great financial education, they could easily lose track of money that they have spent. It's so easy, of course, to use contactless cards and you can make up to five transactions or up to £300 worth of transactions before having to put in your PIN. So once again, it's a, it could certainly um, impact upon vulnerable customers in, in uh, them losing track of how much money they've spent. There are also fears that it will mean more retailers move away from accepting cash, and I think we're seeing this trend already. Of course, many retailers will still accept cash, but I think it's becoming a preferred method that um, many retailers are actually preferring to use card or contactless. Of course, it's convenient for the customer, but nonetheless, it's also convenient for the retailer. It's a lot quicker for them. They don't have to deal with cards, coins, and change and it also makes it much easier to account for them, even small businesses, rather than taking coins and cash and adding up the, the takings for the day at the end of the, 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 the day. Um, taking contactless payments mean it can be all automatically calculated um, without, um, without having that extra, extra time taken to, to calculate. So... Yes, I can see why retailers uh, are probably keen to move away from accepting cash, but it is at the potential detriment of, as the case study says, those customers who still rely on cash. So, from £10 to £100, we mentioned earlier that the contactless limit has increased drastically. When tap-and-go cards were introduced in 2007, the limit for contactless payments was set at just £10. This was increased to £15 a few years later, then to £20 before going to £30 in 2015. Last year, as one of the measures to combat the spread of the coronavirus, it rose to £45. Now it's set to more than double. The move brings contactless closer to other payment methods with no limits, such as Apple Pay. Now it suggests that that final line there, that really, in order to effectively compete with the likes of Apple Pay, contactless had to move with the times and and become closer to other payment limit payment methods such as Apple Pay, which actually have no limits on them. Very convenient uh, for people who use Apple products uh, using Apple Pay. But it says prior that tap and go cards, as they used to be known. Um, have obviously gone up tenfold from £10 now to £100. At the bottom of page number 13, there has been a sharp rise in the number of people paying by tapping their card since the beginning of the pandemic. Figures from the Banking Trade Association, UK Finance, show the value of such transactions was up almost 45% in November 2020 compared with the previous year, as more retailers moved away from accepting cash. So, sharp rise, up 45%. Figures are from the Banking Trade Association, um, so we'd like to think that that was a fairly reliable source. But bear in mind, this 
month, November 2020, was also when many people were were going through the COVID pandemic. So it might have been during lockdown. It might have been when people were isolating. So as you can imagine, if people were free to move about as much as they wanted, that figure is potentially likely to be significantly more. So, but still, 45%, almost half up on the, the year previously. Many meat retailers moved away from accepting cash entirely. So, of course, as we said earlier, that was at the detriment of those who rely on cash. But nonetheless, it was certainly beneficial um, in terms of convenience for consumers and retailers alike. And, of course, it stopped the, the spread of, of COVID. Page number 14 begins with debt risks. So the pandemic has driven more people into debt, with one in four adults now financially vulnerable. There is concern that £100 limit could lead to increase in debtedness. Stacey Lohman of the financial coaching app Clairo says the easy nature of contactless can take accountability away from consumers and allow them to lose track of what they are spending. We'd expect Stacey Lohman to, to know a, a lot about this issue. Obviously, she comes from a financial coaching app. And I think it's a, a, a key statistic to note that one in four adults, this is on the top line, are now classed as financially vulnerable. The pandemic, as we know, drove a lot of people into debt. Maybe they were out of work or were on the furlough scheme. But nonetheless... Now that that furlough scheme has obviously ended, uh, if, if those people were unable to get their jobs back or their hours were cut, that causes a significant issue, of co especially in the current cost of living crisis with huge energy bill and utility bill payments. There is concern that the £100 limit could increase this indebtedness that these one in four adults currently uh, experience. And as we said, the easy nature of contactless, it almost, as Stacey says, takes accountability away from consumers. It's very easy now to spend very quickly. And as we'll see later on in the case study, it really it, um, it's just associated with a simple tap of the card. And up to £100, you know, a simple tap might not give the, the user, the individual, uh, time to really consider the amount of money that they are spending. So it moves on. A quote from Stacy: There is less time to think about or reconsider the purchases, she says. As you don't even have to hand your over your bank card, the sense of financial loss, otherwise known as the pain of payment, isn't felt nearly as much as with cash. Or even a non-contactless card. Lohman says because the limit was £30 for a number of years, consumers typically associate a simple tap of the card with a smaller value purchase, such as a takeaway coffee or a public transport ticket. I think this is another key paragraph. As Stacey says, using a contactless card gives hardly any time to think or reconsider purchases. You don't have to hand over a significant amount of coins or, or notes. You don't have to even put in a pin with payments up to £100. And therefore, tapping your card, there is real, really no sense of financial loss. You're not handing over physical coins and notes. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the pain of payment, as it's... It, who used to be known, essentially, when you are handing over vast wads of notes, it's not really felt anymore, you know, with a contactless card. It's just it's, it's just a simple tap and you could spend £100. The limit was £30 for a number of years, and and consumers associated that with, uh, with smaller value purchases. Because it was only up to £30, uh, a takeaway coffee, a public transport ticket, but because it's now a hundred pounds and it's having to do exactly the same action, a simple tap, it's over obviously three times as much as that initial limit, and consumers still associate it with smaller value purchases.
So the next paragraph, the fourth one down on page 14, she says this is unlikely to change because the increased limit has. That is uh, the fact that consumers associate a simple tap of the card with smaller value purchases. The phenomenon of mental accounting may come into play too, as the increase could be considered an unexpected gain by some, she adds. So mental accounting is the idea we, that we create imaginary money accounts, if you like, in our mind. And I think what this lady Stacy is referring to here is the fact that we associate the simple tap of a card with a smaller value purchase. Our cognition has been programmed, if you like, through the number of years at which the limit was £30 to associate a, a simple tap of the card with a small purchase. But of course it's more than tripled since that £30 limit, now at £100, and therefore we still associate it with a small, a small purchase, and mental accounting tricks us into, into believing that. So it's unlikely that we'll change our behaviours just because the contactless limit has increased. And as it mentioned earlier, those one in four adults who are now financially vulnerable, if they are still perceiving a simple tap of their card with smaller value purchases, that could, of course, lead to uh, indebtedness very, very quickly. The next section is about the fear of fraud. The increased limit has also brought concern that customers will be more susceptible to having their cards stolen and payments made without their knowledge. It is hard for contactless payments to be stopped by a bank, so even if you report your card stolen immediately, it can still be used by a thief. This is an interesting paragraph because it says earlier on, as we know in the case study, that there are a number of different ways to uh, reduce the potential for fraud. Of course, you can cancel your card, you can turn off contactless, uh, which is potentially two things you'd do if your card was stolen. But this, uh, this paragraph um, is a bit of a cause for concern because it says that it's hard for contactless payments to be stopped by a bank. So even if your card is stolen, it can still be used by a thief. And that is uh, certainly something that Amber should, uh, should keep in mind. Sarah Pennells, Head of Financial Capability at the insurer Royal London, says card theft is now more attractive and the UK should look at what other countries are doing to stop fraud. Cardholders, she says, should always check the amount they are paying on machines before tapping and check their bank balances regularly for unexplained entries. So, yeah, it's true, card theft seems more attractive to, to thieves and the UK should look at, according to Sarah, what other countries are doing to stop fraud. Card holders, and this is some really good advice, should check definitely the amount they are paying on machines before choosing to make the tap with their cards and check their bank balances regularly. Of course, later on in the case study we'll see that several accounts, with several accounts you can set up instant alerts. So as soon as you pay through contactless for example, it can flash up on your phone or mobile device how much you have spent. So, so that might be a, a wise thing for Amber to do in this case, if she's worried about fraud and overspending. Page number 15 then. Loman advises turning notifications on if you are using a banking app so that every payment can be tracked. If there is any unexpected account, sorry, activity on your account, contact your bank straight away. So as we said, turning notifications on means that you'll get an instant payment uh, uh, notification every time you make a payment or a thief makes a payment using your contactless card. And that was, as we said, from The Guardian. Moving on then on page number 15, Amber is considering the following three providers for her current account, including her existing account with Barclays. So we have three different current accounts, and I'd be surprised if there's not a question which asks about these three, and which one Amber should actually use. 
The first one, Barclays, she's with this current account already. And as we'd heard earlier on in the case study, she's been loyal to Barclays since she was a, a young girl when she got a children's account with them. She's obviously stuck with them um, since that her childhood, now being 21. And this is what they offer. It's a personal current account. The credit interest rate, so if there's any money within her uh, current account, uh, this is the interest which is uh, made on it or awarded for having savings in it, um, is for Barclays 0%. Now, many people would see that as a, as a negative, but as we know from the, one of the first paragraphs in this case study, Amber currently has no savings, so she wouldn't benefit even if there was a very high interest rate. Her overdraft interest rate, the APR, in Barclays is 35%. So if she goes into her overdraft and is unable to pay it back, the APR is 35%, that annual uh, rate on that. Interest-free overdraft. Now, this is the only account with Barclays out of the three that offers a, a, a small interest-free overdraft. Now, as we heard earlier on, Amber has chosen to sort herself a £400 overdraft but it's nice to know that if she just dips into that up to £15 Barclays will not charge her any interest and other supporting information as we said Amber's existing provider is Barclays and they have a local branch in the area so that could be attractive although Amber is only seldom visiting branches now according to the case study as she chooses to do the vast majority of the banking on mobile. Virgin Money, their account is M plus account, actually offer quite a substantial credit interest rate. If your account is in credit you've got some uh, money in there they'll offer 2.02% up to £1,000 in your account. So that could be quite attractive if Amber begins to save money. But of course, when we look, think about it, 2% of 1,000, 2% of 1,000 is £20. So the actual benefit, if she had £1,000, let's just say, in her account, would be a, a small amount over £20 per year. So not a lot more than £1.50 per month. Is that enough incentive to make her choose Virgin? Well, potentially, if she is going to have a credit amount uh, in her account. The next thing is the overdraft interest rate of Virgin Money, 19.9%, which of course is less than Barclays, but of course more than Starling. So that could be um, attractive compared to her current account at Barclays, which she currently has. But is it a, is it a, a deal breaker? Potentially, if she's often in her um, her overdraft, it might be attractive. Um, but she seems to manage her finances quite well. So even though she's got that four hundred pound overdraft, we can assume that, and we may get more information on this in the additional information during the exam. But we can assume that she doesn't dip into that overdraft that much. The next one is, of course, the interest-free overdraft, and both Virgin and Starling do not offer an interest-free overdraft facility, uh, unlike Barclays, which is the first £15. Once again, is, uh, is that a reason not to go for Virgin and, and Starling? I, um, I don't necessarily think so, if there are other more important or, or more significant benefits to those two accounts. But something which may attract Amber to the Virgin Money account is in the other supporting information she can gain a 100 pound virgin voucher if she chooses to switch to virgin money 100 pounds is obviously a significant amount and uh, it's given simply for switching to virgin money so it's uh, uh yeah it might be slightly inconvenient getting to know how to use a new app a new bank and obviously they may not have a, a local branch however 100 pounds obviously not to be sniffed at something for amber to seriously consider and then we come on to starling starling's classed as one of these new challenger banks uh, uh, 
often challenger banks do not have a high high street presence and starling is one of those don't have any actual physical branches so they uh, uh, amber won't be able to go to her local branch like she does currently with barclays let's see what the starling bank current account currently offers then so the credit interest rate of 0.05 percent it's more than Barclays, but significantly less than Virgin Money. And once again, if we compare, uh, let's just say, a £1,000 uh, credit balance, she'd get nothing in Barclays, she'd get about £20 per year in Virgin Money. So if she chose the Starling Bank current account, if she had a £1,000 credit in, credit in her account, She'd benefit from 0.05% interest, and that would equate to 50p per year. So therefore, not really a realistic reason to choose Starling over Barclays, um, even though it does have an interest rate. Obviously significantly less than Virgin money, but even Virgin with £1,000 in the account would only give Amber an amount of £20 interest per year. Is that a reason to go with Virgin money? Potentially. It's obviously money for not doing anything, it's just having a positive balance in your account, but nonetheless, it's not a huge amount. Then we come on to overdraft interest rate. This could be an attractive reason to go with Starling. They have the lowest overdraft interest rate out of the three providers. And therefore, if Amber is regularly in her overdraft, and um, I guess there's nothing really in the case study to say that she is. However, we might find out more in the additional information. then she'd actually have the lowest interest rate for her overdraft, which would be um, a reason potentially for going with Starling. Now, as we said earlier, they do not offer any interest-free overdraft like Barclays. But the other supporting information, they were voted the best current account provider by the British Bank Awards. Now, I know in Starling's promotional material, they've made a, a, a big deal out of the fact that they've been voted the best current account provider, and that could potentially sway Amber's view. Knowing that they were voted the best current account provider suggests that many other individuals who use that current account would recommend it. So that's a potentially quite a significant argument to go with Starling. But whether we choose Barclays, Virgin or Starling will, deter will be determined, I think, based upon what the apps offer. So let's have a look at what the three apps for these providers offer. After the table, you can see the following information details the apps that are provided with these current accounts. And what we'll be looking for here is, obviously, Amber is concerned about security and fraud of her con contactless payment card. She might uh, want to good app that can help her budget and save up for different different purchases or investments she wants to make and therefore we'll be looking at those sorts of things when we analyze these so the first app is barclays the benefits that we'll get are firstly the money management tools yes the app is set you can set up an arranged overdraft to suit your needs within the app optional arranged overdrafts Open and manage your account with the Barclays app. So these are all money management tools that uh, can be useful to uh, to Amber. But of course, she's already organised an arranged overdraft of £400. So she's taken that option already. Um, so those three potentially wouldn't really um, sway her. Let's have a look at page number 16. What else do Barclays offer on their app then? Well, spending insights. Amber will be able to see a summary of her spending by category, shop or business. Now that could be attractive because early on in the case study it says that she is, is good at budgeting and, and she, she uh, doesn't want to go over her agreed uh, limit, the, the limit she's put in her head. She can track where and when she's made payments. So that could be uh, appropriate because she's worried about fraud and if uh, if someone is obviously making... Uh, fraudulent 
payments on her contactless card, then she'll she'll be able to get notifications of that. She can also set daily spending limits, which might help her to budget, which is a real, real opportunity for her to, to manage her spending effectively. Flexible security controls. Now, these are the things that might uh, sway Amber's uh, choice. She can temporarily freeze her debit card if she can't find it. Now, that is a, a real unique, unique selling point, being able to temporarily freeze and unfreeze uh, her card if she can't find it. She can get a PIN reminder whenever she needs it. She can report her card lost or stolen. And she can upload a video selfie and add photo ID to verify her identity. So, significant security measures when accessing that banking app, which may be attractive to Amber. Then we come on to Virgin Money. They allow you to track your transactions. You can automatically tag each transaction with one of 20 presets or create custom tags. So this will enable Amber, as it says earlier on in the case study, if I just flick back to it, um, she can she often splits her remaining money into weekly amounts, withdrawing most of this as cash, and it ensures she does not overspend from month to month. So, looking at this, automatically being able to tag transactions with one of 20 presets or actually create custom tags this will enable amber to effectively track the transactions and ensure she doesn't overspend on on up to 20 categories she can also budget better she can see her spending and what she has left each month so if she's gone over budget the app will let her know which is a handy tool to have she can save cleverly she can pick a goal create a pot for it and transfer money to it when she can now obviously we don't have any um, knowledge at present of amber's aspirations for the future potentially we'll get given that in our additional information but nonetheless if she does have a long-term aspiration potentially it might be because she lives with her nan at the moment it may be to save for uh, the house deposit for example then the virgin money app will enable her to to track and transfer uh, money towards that goal. She can manage well, she can view previous statements, set up and manage direct debits and standing orders. I'm not sure that that on its own would encourage her to go with Virgin Money because I'm sure that the other two apps also enable that facility. She can move cash to start of page 17. Running low but got cash in your savings account, a sweep tool. Now, this is another unique selling point, uh, something unique about the Virgin Money app, which might sway Amber. So their sweep tool will automatically move some of her savings account money into her current account. Now, the theory behind that, I imagine, is that it will enable Amber to avoid going into her overdraft. As we know, Virgin Money does not offer any interest-free overdrafts like Barclays do, albeit only £15, and therefore she wants to avoid going into her overdraft if she can. And the sweep tool, if she opens a savings account with Virgin, will automatically move money from her savings into her current account to avoid her going into her overdraft. However, that said, although it's a unique selling point of Virgin, she does not currently have any savings so even with that feature there would be no savings for the sweep tool to draw from to move into her current account the next thing is that it's simple and secure amber will be able to spot fraud quickly with transaction alerts now yes that's one thing that virgin money offer but i believe that all the other accounts will also offer that so moving on to Starling Bank. As we said earlier, Starling is one of the new challenger banks, along with the likes of things like Monzo. Not having any physical stores, that might be um, a deterrent to um, Amber actually going with this bank. But as we'll see later on, there is the ability to, to deposit physical amounts of cash. We'll, we'll come on to that shortly. So... Features fit for an award-winning account. As I said earlier, Starling Bank have made a big deal out of the fact that they have 
won the award for the best current account and why not it's a great marketing um, a point for them as part of the bank app you can get instant notifications whenever payments leave or enter your account so for amber that will be great for tracking her spending categorized spending insights seeing where when and how your spending makes budgeting fast and easy just like virgin uh, you can obviously see where you're spending money but it seems that virgin money can you can you can maybe uh, custom that to a greater extent you can create custom uh, accounts um, not accounts uh, you can create uh, custom tags sorry um, spaces put money aside in virtual piggy banks automatically round up transactions to save the change and give someone a connected card if they're spending on your behalf now this is some unique selling points of the starling bank account Money aside in virtual piggy banks, fine, but automatically rounding up transactions to save the change. That is a nice feature offered by Starling. Essentially, if you're buying something which is 6 95 it allows you the option to automatically round up those transactions, maybe to £7 in that case, so you can put that 5p of change aside into a savings account. Now, will that... Uh, equate to a significant amount well it depends really how much uh, amber uh, spends of course but um i can't i i'm not sure that it would be a significant feature which would which would make her go for this uh, bank account rather than rather than the other current accounts but the fact that you can give someone a connected card if they're spending on your behalf for many people this will be an attractive proposition but Amber, she's 21, she doesn't have any dependents or a spouse that we know of, um, and therefore there's unlikely to be anyone spending on her behalf, and therefore the fact that they offer a connected card it is a feature that Amber is perhaps unlikely to use and therefore would not sway her to go for Starling over the other two. A new way to pay. Settle IOUs with a simple payment link, send money to nearby Starling customers, or split bills with a tap. This Starling bank obviously offers a lot of uh, unique selling points, and, and this these are some of them. Send, being able to send money to nearby Starling customers, or split bills with a tap. Now, in order to send money to other Starling customers, of course, they have to have the Starling Bank uh, app and account as well. So it only really works if your friends or family group or whoever you're sending money to are members of the Starling Bank as well, or customers, sorry, of the Starling Bank as well. Lock your card with a tap. Use the app to lock your card if it goes missing and block gambling transactions and payment methods too. It might be that... Uh, Amber uh, would like to block gambling transactions and therefore this would be an attractive thing for her. Uh, using the app to lock your card if it goes missing, well, it's not a unique point. Other current accounts that we've looked at also offer that feature, but she can uh, block payment methods as well. So if she wants to block the contactless feature, for example, on her card, then we'd assume that the Starling Bank app would enable her to do that. Before we get into the final few pieces of information, remember I've created a video which contains 40 test yourself comprehension questions to really assess your understanding of the case study. Make sure you click on this. Only when you can get all 40 questions right do you truly know the case study back to front. On to page number 18 in terms of cash. Now, Amber will be able to withdraw from ATMs, which uh, will be the same as with other accounts, but the many people might be concerned that there's no physical branches to deposit cash. Well, the good thing is that Starling Bank enables um, consumers to deposit cash at any one of the post office's 11,500 branches. So that is a real uh, benefit to this account and actually is relatively competitive with some of the some of the major banks. 
Post office branches, however, um, and might be a good counter argument to use if you're going along this line, is uh, is that many post office branches, just like bank branches, are, are closing. So it could be a of benefit to her if she lives in a rural area where there's uh, only obviously a Barclays branch. Uh, that's said earlier in the case study, and the post office, that will enable her to be able to deposit cash at the post office. And another unique selling point of the Starling Bank uh, app is that, uh, and their current account, is that their MasterCard debit card is made from recycled plastic, the very first of its kind in the UK. So MasterCard debit card, obviously debit card will take money directly out of her account as soon as she makes payment. The, the alternative is of course a credit card and uh, it's made from recycled plastic. We don't know if Amber is particularly environmentally aware but if she is that could be um, an attractive proposition to her, the fact that it's made from recycled plastic. However, we don't have that sort of information available to us and we may get more when it comes to the actual um, additional information provided, but we don't have that information at the moment, so we don't know whether that would be something that would persuade her to go for Starling rather than the other two. So now is the time to check your understanding and comprehension of this case study. Make sure you click on the link above. There'll be 40 questions to test yourself. Model answer videos will be arriving shortly. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of when these are released.